Grab your Bibles, go to the book of Luke. Um, we are in the middle. Um, well, at least today is the second part, and I just want to revisit one thing um, that I want to share with you. So I have a one-point sermon uh, this morning uh, with a couple of sub-points, but I just want to back up a little bit just to kind of let you know where we are so we can allow God to be God in our midst. So bow your heads with me in prayer, and then we're going to move and allow the Holy Spirit to um, speak to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for you. As we go to the word this morning, uh, Felix dies. Felix surrenders himself because he really doesn't have anything to say. Amen. It's about you and it's about the Holy Spirit. And all we want to do is to be more like you. So we love you this morning. We praise you. We give you glory for all. Everything that we do belongs to you. And we just want to make the adjustments, Lord, to be like you, Lord. So continue to teach us. Continue to speak to us. Um, we stay silent so you could speak. And we worship you for when you do speak, Lord. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. Luke chapter 4. Go with me to Luke chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to read just a little bit of this verse for, um, to level set a little bit. And then we're going to back up and I'm going to review the points that I shared with you. And then talk about um, the one thing I want you to take away this morning with me. Luke chapter 4. And jump down to verse 18. I just want to read two verses of scripture. We're going to hang out there. Then there's a couple more that I'm going to share along the way. But um, I want God to speak this morning to us. If you're there, say amen. amen. Here's, a, here's what this passage says. Very, very familiar passage of Scripture that we all are very familiar with. And it begins by saying this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now here is um, some of what we shared a little bit this morning, I mean last week, that I want to kind of review a little bit. Repeat out of me, say, um, self. self. We, have we have to learn how to rebel, how to rebel. About the, against the rebellion. Yeah, I could get that right. One more time. Say self. self. I must learn how to rebel against the rebellion. Now, I won't back up too much. I just want to say to you, um, if you missed last week's message, uh, it would give you a little bit of context. I want to encourage you to go online to our website, to our YouTube channel, to our podcast, and download the podcast. It'll give you a picture of what we're saying. And here's all I want to say about that just by way of context before I move to what I want to share with you is that the enemy has come into God's kingdom and he's leading a rebellion. Just hear it that way. And so what he's done is that he's entered the kingdom of God and he's causing people to rebel against God's kingdom, resulting in him establishing his own kingdom on the earth. Now, God's intent is not that you and I be a part of the rebellion. You kind of get what I'm saying? He wants us to rebel. Against, yeah, you get it. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, he wants us to rebel against the rebellion. He don't want us to participate in the rebellion. We've got enough church folk doing that, all right? And so not here. Amen. Come on, say amen. So our job, our job is to go in the rebellion and rebel against it and pull people out and help God reestablish his kingdom on earth. You kind of get it? So that's, that's the mission, right? That's what this is all about. So that's what we want to talk about, reestablishing the kingdom of God. So here's, here's the big idea. I kind of cleaned it up a little bit um, to help us a little focus a little better today. God's mission in the earth is to reestablish his kingdom by mobilizing believers. Let's watch this. To rescue people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Oh, come on, say amen. Y'all too quiet. Come on. Does that make sense? That's the mission, right? Is, 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 is to, to mobilize believers to rescue people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I had one of my members, one of our members said to me um, yesterday when they kind of saw this on Facebook, they said, um, I hope I'm part of the kingdom of light. And I got a little... Um, beside myself, and I said, hey, by virtue of the fact that you're a member of Restoration, you in the light. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get that right. Amen. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> but just want, <laughs> want her to get that. But there's four things I share with you um, that I want to um, back up and, oh, and I, don't, I want to kind of review and talk briefly with you. And before I go into that, let me, let me do this. I want to, here's the first thing I said to you. Number one is that if we're going to rebel against the rebellion, we must have a clear understanding of our identity in Christ. So say this, self, self. I must know who I am. We're going to deal with it. One more time, say self. Self. I must know who I am. am. Secondly, and I'm going to spend the time here, if I'm going to rebel against the rebellion, I must be clear on what God's mission is in the earth. Okay? Say one more time, say self. Self. I must be clear of God's mission in the earth. The third thing is you must have a clear understanding, this is important, that the kingdom is now. All right? And I'll talk about this in the upcoming weeks. So you don't want to miss when we talk about that because there's a present and a future aspect of the kingdom. And here's all I said about that that I want to re- rehash. A lot of us live our Christianity waiting to go to heaven to experience the kingdom. And I want to challenge our theology to let you know that by virtue of the fact that you've accepted Christ, you can, ex- in- yeah, now. Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk about the present and the future aspect of the case. So just repeat. Just say, kingdom is now. Kingdom is now. Say it again. Say, kingdom is, now. kingdom is now. That's good news. That's good news. And here's the last thing that I'm going to walk into what I want to do. To win the fight against the rebellion, we must have a clear understanding that the focus of God's kingdom is infiltrating the enemy's domain and not so much focus and simply blessing those who are already part of the kingdom. You in, all right? Let's go get folk who are not in, all right? And here's what we do. We spend a lot of church on people who are already in and very little service on those who are not in. Does that make sense? So today, today what I want to do is I'm going to back into number two and I'm going to spend some time talking about the mission of God's on the earth because I really want to... Um, get an idea of what that is all about. So one more time uh, with the big idea, I just want you all to get this picture in your heart. Let me put that back up there real quick so we can get a feel of that. And that's it right there. God's mission in the earth is to reestablish his kingdom by mobilizing believers to rescue people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Let's not miss that as we kind of go through. Then I'm going to share some things with you. Amen. Uh, Let me get my tech people ready because this thing's kind of messing up on me a little bit, and they might need to change slides for me if I can't get it to go. It's changed? Okay, good. So before I talk about that, here's me. I got saved when I was the age of 12. Uh, I got saved very, very young. And because I came to Christ so early, my perception of what the kingdom of God is was some abstract thing that existed way out there, okay? And so here, come on, y'all. Am I talking to only myself, y'all? Come on, is it? Yeah. And it was just something that was way out there. And, and um, you know, and then the preacher would preach his message and, you know, so on and so forth. They would teach. They would do all that stuff. But I always heard that when you die, you're going to go to heaven and reap the benefits of the kingdom of God. And that's true, okay? That's true. But I was never taught to reap the benefits here on earth. Are you with me? So for me, kingdom was some eschatological concept. And what that word means, it just speaks the end time. Some concept that's going to happen at the end. And here's a word that we've all heard. When Jesus comes back to rapture his church, are you with me? That will get to go to be with God. So I live I lived life, the majority of my Christianity in a closed community, Um, almost, I mean, almost like an Amish type community where all we did was we got saved and we huddled up and waited for Jesus to come back. I think some of y'all did the same thing. Yeah. And here's what the huddle looked like every Sunday morning, depending on whether it was nine or 11, you just came and you huddled. (laughs) Sang Kumbaya, my Lord. Good songs, right? He thought I was worth saving, all that good stuff. And then we went home and waited for heaven. Oh, come on, y'all. Yeah. That's what we did. That's what we did. That's what we did. Because we didn't know the kingdom is now. And more importantly, we forgot the mission that God has in store for us. But I want to just spend some time to emphasize the truth this morning that God's kingdom is alive. 
God's kingdom is active. Come on. God's kingdom is thriving. God's kingdom is very, very present in the earth today. Let me read a couple of things that I want you all to hear about the kingdom of God. L- listen to this as we kind of read through this. Uh, according to the testimony of the first three gospels, that's the gospel in the, in, uh, in the Bible, the proclamation of the kingdom of God was Jesus' central message. In the gospel, the phrase kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven is used roughly over 80 times in over 80 plus verses. In Matthew 3, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then in Matthew 6, here's how Jesus prayed with his disciples. He said this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then in Matthew 12, here's what Jesus says when he was casting out demons. He says, but if by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, listen to this, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Don't miss all the present tense words that I'm, verbs that I'm using. In, in Mark 1 and 15, he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Then Matthew summarizes Jesus' Galilean ministry with the words, Jesus traveled, listen to this, throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching everywhere the good news about the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount, right, in in Matthew um, 5, is all about Jesus being concerned with the righteousness that qualifies people to enter the kingdom of God. If you were to look at Matthew 13, all the parables that are in Matthew 13 and Mark 4, they illustrate the mystery of the kingdom. The establishment of the Lord's Supper, which we just did, it looks forward to the time when we're going to sit again at the table of God and enjoy the kingdom. And the New Testament itself, it reports two different forms of expressions. It says the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But all of those speak to the truth that God's kingdom is at hand. God's kingdom is here and God's kingdom is now. The reason I wanted to point that out is you will notice Jesus' ministry. It was not so much an internal only ministry, even though he did go to the synagogue to worship but he had a major external focus about his ministry because he came to let people know that the kingdom of God is now, okay? And here's what I want you to hear me say, and here's what Luke 4 is all about. And we dealt with Luke a lot last week, so I'm just going to talk about it on the surface level. When Jesus came on the scene, he came on the scene to bring realization to the kingdom of God. So come on, say the kingdom is now. Come on, say it again. So the kingdom of now is now. So I'm going to spend the majority of the remainder of our time in the next upcoming weeks to help us see this kingdom concept, and hopefully we'll be able to live it out. So here's a biblical definition that I want us to grapple with as we talk about what the kingdom is. That is, it's the sovereign rule of God initiated by Christ's earthly ministry and consummated when the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Let me explain what that means. By virtue of the fact that Jesus came on the scene over 2,000 plus years ago, when he, when he was birthed from his mother Mary and he began his public ministry, the kingdom began. Come on, y'all, all All right? And here's what that that, um, verbiage is saying. It's going to be consummated when he returns for his church and we leave the earth to go spend time with him in eternity, okay? That's when we go next level kingdom. I wish I had somebody. (laughs) But but in the interim, you got to hear that the kingdom is now. So here, I want want you to to grapple with these definitions now. These are some underground definition of what I'm going to say the kingdom is. So the kingdom of God, watch this, is a radical rejection of every value or point of view that keeps people in bondage and untrue. Blinded to Christ's mercy, it is a refusal to classify any person as being expendable or beyond reach. Let me explain. Here's what the kingdom of God said. I don't care what you did, how you did it, when you did it, how long ago you did it. God loves you. He can reclaim you. That's kingdom thinking, right? Here's kingdom thinking. Kingdom said, kingdom thinking never says that no one is beyond reach or is 
unredeemable. That means if you're thinking kingdom, everybody has a fair opportunity. I need a couple more amens than that. Because I used to think, excuse the grammar, I used to think that I didn't deserve God's love. But by virtue of the fact that Jesus came on the scene and brought kingdom into reality, that means I have a chance. So here's what he says it in Scripture, right? Whosoever will, let him come. Let me define whosoever for you. It means the person you can't stand, there's an opportunity for them in kingdom. Come on. Let me define whosoever for you. It's the person that gets on your reserved nerve. Come on. Uncle Bubba and them that you don't want to have nothing to do with, that person, the kingdom can reach them. And here's the depth of what I'm saying. God wants you to bring kingdom to them. And if we don't know the reach of the kingdom, we will miss what God is trying to do. Oh, come on, say, man, I want y'all, I want y'all to walk this out with me. Let's kind of get this in our spirit. So the kingdom of God is an unwillingness to view any situation as something that cannot be transformed or infused with hope. Let me explain that one. Here's what the kingdom of God says. There is nobody on the face of the earth that you can't be friends with. <laughs> Some of y'all just checked out. Because <laughs> you just said to me, y'all know what she did. No. No. Kingdom says it doesn't matter what she did or what he did, all right? Because you did something too. And by virtue of the fact that God reached you, he wants to use you to go reach them, all right? So lock into this. Kingdom subjects don't have enemies. <laughs> y'all ain't ready for this. Y'all ain't ready for this. Y'all, y'all, yeah, y'all just wanted to sing a good hymn and go home. No, 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 no. Kingdom subjects don't have enemies. You got to get this, right? So here's what it sounds like in the kingdom. And we're going to talk about this a lot of time. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's kingdom, right? If somebody hits you, don't go to the court and sue them. Just give them the other stuff. Y'all, that's kingdom. Y'all aren't ready for that. Y'all, if they hit you, turn the other cheek. Don't have a gun so you can... Uh, you, you're not ready for kingdom. You're not ready for kingdom. Because we like to fight. We like a good fight, Right? And, 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 and that's, that's, that's how the world operates. That's the enemy's kingdom. But in God's kingdom, it doesn't function like that. <laughs> Y'all, come on, just say help him, help him, Jesus. Come on, say help him, Jesus, right? So, so we're going to spend a lot of time, we're going to spend a lot of time living differently, thinking differently, acting differently, behaving differently, because of what the kingdom is all about, right? Now, uh, here's where I want to begin. Uh, I want to share two things with you. This is the first one. The kingdom, as it relates to the kingdom, God's kingdom should be subversive while invading the enemy's territory. I'm going to explain that, okay? God's kingdom should be subversive while invading the enemy's territory. And let me tell you what I mean by subversion. It's not about public display, but it's about quiet effectiveness. Because <laughs> we like a good protest. <laughs> we like a good march against, right? Subversion means that we undercut for effectiveness, right? Let me, let, me, let me share a couple of things with you um, that might rub you wrong, but just go with me. You all had history. And no, it's not your grandmother. Um, anybody know who that is? Harriet Tubman. Yeah, yeah, Harriet Tubman. Um, here's why I want to use her as an illustration um, to talk about the subvertive, subversive nature of kingdom. In the early years of American history, we had a rough start. And what that meant is that slavery was very, very prominent in our culture. And we had Americans that would go over to Africa and they would purchase blacks from Africa and they would bring them back to the United States and they would make them work as slaves. Uh, my personal opinion on that perspective is that I don't believe it's biblical, um, but I think that was the enemy's way of continuing to build his kingdom, if I could use that term, right? 
And so what we had was we had slavery in America in its early years, which was a very, very tough thing. And sad to say, in today's day and age, we're still suffering the consequences of, of the hurt and the wounds and all that stuff that happened during the slavery era. Come on, can we be honest about that? Yeah, we're, st we're still trying to figure out how to heal about that. But the reason I, wanna, I brought that up is because I want you to, to get this picture with me. During the slavery era, there were people that were known as abolitionists. And what the abolitionists were, they were individuals that believed literally based on biblical mandate that we were all created in the image of God and that everyone was equal and everyone had a right. And more importantly, they thought slavery was wrong. And what the abolitionists did was they set out to try to fight against slavery to put an end to it. Now, the reason I brought this lady up on the screen is because she struck me as I was praying, Lord, what's a good illustration to really amplify the point? And the Lord dropped Harriet Tubman in my mind. This lady was born um, into slavery, a uh, generation of slavery in her life. Her mom, um, dad, brothers and sisters just had a rough childhood um, as a slave, even growing into her adulthood. She got sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> yeah, come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. And, 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 and she, she got tired of hanging out in the enemy camp. Uh, the problem, the problem with, with Harriet that I'm still processing is that um, she had a distaste for the New Testament. And the reason for her distaste, in the, distaste of the New Testament was that slave owners would use the New Testament against slaves to kind of keep them in slavery. She did, however, love the Old Testament. And what she loved most about the Old Testament was the deliverance story of Moses. And she saw the people of Israel as people like her that were locked in captivity in the enemy's camp. And more importantly, she messed up and messed, read Moses' story where he went down to Pharaoh to tell him, let God's people go. I want y'all to see how the Bible influences people. So here's what Harriet did as life pursued. She messed around and escaped and got her own freedom, right? Now, she escaped and she found herself free, but here's the beauty of her freedom. She didn't escape just for the mere pleasure of escaping. <laughs> yeah, she, she escaped, and then her life's mission became to go back into enemy territory Come on now, and listen to the words I'm going to use, and rescue others that found themselves in bondage, are you with me, and position them to a place of freedom. And so she had a lot of help. She had help from some of the abolitionists. She had help from some of individuals that had secret or private houses, or, and, and so they developed this whole thing called the Underground Railroad, and you know, I used to think that was a train, you know? <laughs> They'll tell you how smart I was, right? But it was a process that they used to rescue people from slavery to get them into freedom. And she would literally go in and she's charted as having delivered a lot of people, rescued a lot of people from the grips of slavery, primarily her family members and other people, and positioned them to a point where they were free. Now, the reason I use her is that, and here's where the word subversive come in, Right? Um, Harriet didn't show up, hey, y'all, let all the slaves free. She didn't announce her presence. <laughs> she didn't come with signs, and she didn't come with all that stuff. Why did she not do that? Because the enemy had fabricated and manufactured these things where laws were written that if you were found freeing slaves, it could cost you your life. So lock into this. She'd go into enemy's territory and hang out in enemy's territory, and the enemy didn't even know she was there. But what I like about Harriet, she didn't go to enemy's territory just to be hanging out in enemy's territory. She knew her mission. Come on, y'all. And so every time she went into enemy's territory, she came in quietly, she came in unannounced, she came in unknown, but every time she left, y'all not hearing me. She'd have someone with her. And then she'd go back in again to this underground railroad process, quietly unannounced, 
and hanging out, undermining the enemy's territory the whole time. And every time she'd leave, she'd grab somebody else. Come on. And the reason I want y'all to point that out, here's the importance of the subversive nature of the kingdom of God. You will notice with me, the king of king, the God who is Lord of lords, who was on his throne in glory, when he decided to come down and infiltrate the enemy's kingdom, he could have come riding on a white horse. Y'all not hearing me. He could have come with the trumpets being announced. He could have come making all kinds of noise saying, here I come. But notice how he came. Humble, lowly, born to a poor carpenter, living in old rundown Bethlehem. Come on. He could have been born in a palace, but, but he came subtle, born in a stable, born in a manger. And he was so subtle about what he was doing that the enemy didn't know who he was. And the whole time... He was in his enemy camp. Y'all not hearing me. Matter of fact, he was so subversive that there's only two instances recorded in the Bible about him before he announced his public ministry. And here's the beauty. Even when he announced his public ministry, he'd still say this. Shh, I got to get some more folk. So don't tell nobody that I just got you out. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Then he'd go back in and he'd go back in. Come on. And every time he left, just like Harriet, he'd have somebody else. So here's what he'd do. He'd go into enemy's territory. And listen to what he'd do. Open blinded eyes and heal the sick and set the captive free. Y'all missing Luke. Come on. And, and he would feed the hungry. He would clothe the naked. He would raise the dead. And the whole time, the enemy still did not know who he was, but he was operating in the enemy's kingdom, taking people out of the kingdom to bring them into the kingdom of God. But lock into this. He was clear about his mission. Very clear. Church, I want to point this out. I think we can learn some lessons from Harriet. I think we can learn some lessons from Jesus. You're in the world, but we're not. All right? Stop pretending like we got to be in the world, and the whole world needs to know that we're here to save them. And we wonder why we're so ineffective. And you wonder why... The enemy is so after you is because every time we go in the world, here's what we do. We announce our position. And so here's what he does. Attack. Y'all not hearing me. Yeah. But if we can learn to be subversive, just, just find that underground railroad. Come on. And here's what that looks like. Just going over to Shaniqua's house. And just sit next to her. And don't tell her she's going to hell and condemn her. Put your arms around her and let her know God loves her. Come on. Just let her know God cares. Let her know God died for her. Come on. Just, just spend time loving her and quit trying to make all these public announcements. Because when we get loud, tell folk you going to hell and we going to heaven. We lose them. Subversion. Show up for effectiveness. Without giving your position away. Amen. Come on, y'all. We have to learn that. So, so come on, say, I must be subversive. Say it again, say, I must be subversive. Let, 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 me, let me give you this other thing. I want y'all to point it out because here's the second thing I want you to, if we're going to rebel, if we're going to rebel against darkness, we must have a clear understanding of God's mission in the world, right? So, so Harriet, she knew why, where she was. And she knew when she got away, she didn't get away for getting away sake. She knew she was the most qualified to go back in because she knew the dress. She knew the code. I was reading one author, and one author says the way she functioned in the underground rail world is that she'd be in there, and when the people came looking for slaves, she'd grab a broom, and she'd sweep like she was a slave. Y'all not hearing me. <laughs> Y'all not hearing me. She'd pick up trash like she was a slave. Come on. Y'all, y'all missing this because here's the church. We want to go in the world, and we want to sit on the pulpit and look important and act like we can't serve Y'all not hearing me. Act like we can't clean nothing. Act like y'all not hearing me this morning. Act 
act like we're all that when you need to learn to pick up a brick and sweep like a slave. Come on, clean like a slave. Let them see you working because here's what the Bible says. He who knew no sin became sin so you and I can be the righteousness of God in him. God didn't say, you poor sinner, say yourself. He took on my sin because he knew his mission. And because we don't know our mission, we think it's to have good church and good shout, good annual days, good programs, and nobody want to pick up a broom. (laughs) Come on, y'all. Come on. Nobody want to serve. Nobody want to. And we stick out like a sore thumb. There go Christian right there. See, they ain't doing nothing. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> but she, pre- she prevented herself from being recognized. Here's what the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus. Why are you going to the graveyard? Because that's where dead folk are. Why are you going to the hospital? That's where sick people are. Why are you going to the food bank every first Saturday? That's where hungry folk are. Right? And so if I'm going to pull people out, I've got to go where the people who need pulling out hang out. Y'all, come on, come on. So I can pull them out. So the mission is clear, right? The mission is to rescue people from the kingdom of darkness. I'm going to read that scripture in a little while. And then secondly, is to transfer them into the kingdom of life. Man, there's so much to be said about that, but I really don't have time. We're going to talk about that next week. So here's the thing. It's it's rescue and transfer, right? Rescue and transfer. Y'all not hearing me. Rescue. Scott, this is a plug for discipleship, right? And transfer. So here's what we do. We rescue and we leave them there. And wonder why four years later they're still getting drunk. Because you didn't teach them the principles of transfer. Are you with me? Say rescue Rescue. and say transfer. Transfer. One more time. Say rescue Rescue. and then say transfer. Transfer. I have so many stories. Let me give you one. When I first started the church, uh, I used to pack two. We were in Colfax on, um, I can't remember. What's it? Emporium Colfax. Yeah, right on. And. If you know where the Martin Luther King building is, that used to be an old rundown building. We started the church there. Every day I used to pack two lunches and go to work. And I'd go sit in the park during lunchtime, and I'd have lunch with the homeless people, right? And I'd do this. I mean, I did it every day for a long time. Then Billy, y'all remember Billy, if you've been around the church any length of time. Billy said to me one time, hey, Pastor, why do you do this? And I'd say to him in so many words, because I'm here to rescue you. And to transfer. Y'all are getting this. And so I've got to meet you where you're at. And then most importantly, here's what I said to him. I used to be homeless. Amen. And he's like, no. Come on. I'm like, yeah, dude. I know what it's like to sleep on park benches. Amen. I know what it's like to eat out of trash cans. Y'all didn't know that about me, huh? I know what it's like to stand in the food line. I know what it's like to have food stamps and all that stuff. And he's like, Really? No, I can show you pictures, dude. Ever since then, we had a connection with Billy, and we couldn't get Billy to get away from the church. Why did you say that, preacher? Because some of us, God, have brought out of places, and we've forgotten where God brought us from. Are you with me? And we live our Christianity acting like we haven't done anything, and I know I sound like a broken record. God gave you that testimony so you can go to the person. I know what it's like to be pregnant out of wedlock. Y'all not hearing me. I know what it's like to have sex outside of marriage. Y'all not hearing me. I know what it's like to get high. Come on. I know what it's like to over Come on. I, stop acting like y'all all that. Come on. I know what it's like to be hangover from alcohol. Come on. I know what it's like to be all that. But God delivered me. And God sent me back here to sit right next to you to rescue you so I can transfer you into the kingdom of light. We must know the mission. We must know the mission. 
I mean, we the most messed up somebodies they are. Here's what we do. Hey, let me give you a card to come to church. Man, I ain't going to no church. You ought to try this one. And we walk away. They'll love you for real. No, don't start there. Man, I used to be just like you. Start there. Man, I used to mess up like you. Man, I used to have these same problems. You ain't going through nothing that I haven't been through but God. Rescue and transfer, rescue and transfer, rescue and transfer. Let me, let me, let me give you these two scriptures, then I'll, I'll be done. So here's what Colossians says. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and then done what? Yeah, transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. Oh, my gosh. And the forgiveness of what? Look at But our citizenship is where? And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, look at that, transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. I want you to go to bed and have a nightmare about this picture. I do. And whenever you see her, I'm hoping you say, the world needs rescuing. I got away. I got to go back in. <laughs> I got to go back in. I can't live my life up north or in Pennsylvania as if I was never a slave. My deliverance was not about me. There's divine intention attached to my liberation. I must go back in. And listen to Paul. By any means necessary. Come on, Pastor Kay. Any means necessary. Some of y'all, why we got to have jazz and Bible study? By any means necessary. Are you, y'all not hearing me, okay? Why we got to go to Colfax? By any means necessary to bring people out. Bow your heads with me.